Good evening, everyone. 9th of February, 2022. Time for episode 21 of The Last Admiral. We're going to start up where we left off on page 164. The priestess, Lin Whale, advises her general. Jin Jang Lo searched the horizon, anxiously awaiting the first hint of land. Standing tall behind the dragon's figurehead of his flagship, undaunted, he braced his shins against the rail to steady himself as he gazed through his spyglass. Land ho! cried his watchman from the crow's nest. Dead ahead, commander. Steady ahead, Captain Ra, bronze-skinned and brown-haired, ordered. Chachan Ra's sea legs were legendary. His leadership was skillful and ruthless, his crew's loyalty absolute. Sailing on, the hour passed, invisible details of the island improved. Smoke rose from many fires along the beaches, and several knights moved about the area, but heavy swell concealed the firmans true numbers. Disgusted, Jin Jang Lo descended the forward stairs to the deck, turned, and entered his quarters. A series of grand waves caused the ship to lean hard to port, shift aft, and then roll back again, in a chaotic tumult that made everything unsecured roll down from tabletops to the floor and from one side of the deck to the other. His most trusted advisor, Priestess Lin Whale, was then sitting up in her cot, clutching her abdomen and trying to resist the urge to surrender to her seasickness. Doc Alfar, her skin was very dark, which made her striking evergreen eyes stand out all the more from within her pearl-white irises. Her hair was silky black, close-cropped, and curly in a warrior's cut. She was wearing the traditional aoyai, the full-length, form-fitting formal dress of the coven. It had the long, well-tailored sleeves and a high seam along the outer thighs, allowing for freedom of movement. Black and trimmed in red, the crimson hourglass of her sect decorated the left breast panel. Crafted of exotic reptilian skins, her tall boots were enhanced for speed, enchanted for speed, and trimmed in gold. Ornate forearm bracers, inlaid with magical runes, protected her like a suit of armor, and but one simple ring of mithril gold rested at the base of her right ring finger. Looking up, she was clearly not happy about the weather. I need your vision, priestess. The queen has not spoken to me for many weeks, general. Divine for me what you can. The enemy lies in wait for us at Gala, and three of our ships have sailed away to the southeast. Turning around on her cot, Lynn opened the hinged door to her trunk and withdrew a black steel wash basin. Stumbling somewhat, she managed to reach the general's planning table. Bolted solidly to the floor, she braced her body against it and held the basin tightly. I'll need your help, general. Fill the basin with wine, and we shall see what we shall see. Removing the wire and cork from a bottle of genuine 1933 Calfret port wine, he emptied it into the basin, just as another series of high rollers rocked the ship. No stranger to life at sea. He quickly stowed the empty glass in the deep right-hand drawer of his desk, closed it with his knee, and returned his hands to the table and basin to assist her. Luckily, I still have one more bottle. It was an excellent year. Lynn looked at him incredulously, and then, with a word, a wave, and her will, images began to appear upon the surface of the wine. Pictures of soldiers, horses, and fire, and a long beach stained red with blood, with each lurch and labor of the vessel. And the uh, footnotes are Ao Yai, is adopted from the Vietnamese word for gown, but spelled phonetically here. Lurch is to lean or pitch suddenly to the side, and labor as a vessel is said to labor when she rolls or pitches heavily. Okay, continuing on. The images blurred and then reformed, 
as the nature of her divining spell required stillness in order to be effective. The waves are interfering with my magic, so I cannot be sure. There appear to be a few hundred fighters on the beach, general and some horsemen, but most are afoot. In what of the three dragon ships he requested, I know their Admiral Lane, he would never surrender. They circle the island, general. They are passing the village of Cusa, but they are not stopping. But what of the men aboard? Do you see the Admiral among them? It's strange. I see many Dragonian marines, but there are others, women and children, and wounded among them. Is there a large man among them? They say that he stands head and shoulders above most men, with hair and beard of gold. I'm not sure. The waves make it hard to see. No. Wait, yes, I see such a man. He sits next to a soldier with a broken leg, trying to steady him. His clothes are plain, like those of a commoner. Prince Ivan, he explained. I knew it. They say that he is cunning and unpredictable. Lane has failed. The Furman sail for Cena in order to make their escape. What more can I show you, General? Lynn asked. If we sail around the west coast, can we reach Cena before him? Lynn peered deeply into the wine, searching for inspiration, and predicted, The ocean currents and the wind are against us, General. No matter what course we take, the Furman will yet be half of a day ahead of us. His ships at Sina are of Lyoselfar design, with triple masts and slender hulls. Unless bad weather or calamity delays them, we will never catch them. Can you raise me a storm? The goddess has not granted me dominion over the elements, General. His frustration grew with each breath, but he had not achieved his status by being foolhardy. Calming himself, he focused on reason in search of a solution. Will there be no victory here? Lynn rolled her eyes, trying to commune with Lothia and praying for guidance. Peering into the pool again, a knight came into view. Wearing firmish colors, he was clearly no ordinary soldier. Even through her vision, she could feel his code of honor, his righteousness. Blasphemer, she hissed for surely he prayed to one of the humans' many distasteful gods. Spitting in contempt toward his magical image, she thought of a thousand terrible curses to cast upon him. What was even worse than his devotion was the fact that an entire company of such valorous warriors surrounded him. Wretched heretics! May the fangs of Arachnodon drain your pathetic souls! Jin Jang Lo watched her efforts with barely disguised amusement. He knew how excitable his priestess could be. The prince has left many powerful warriors behind to delay you, my general. Land half of your force in Gala, and the other half at Sifa on the north shore, and you may yet kill the king's champion and his men. That will have to be enough for now, he said. When the final invasion begins, I will find this cunning lion again and kill him. Thank you, priestess. I value your guidance. Gravina, will land at Gala with the seventh fleet, and we shall sail to Sifa with the eleventh, and to quote you, then we shall see what we shall see. <clears throat> Barmaids and too much ale at the Whale House Inn. <clears throat> he had spent the night in a small corner bedroom on the second floor of and what had started out as a dreamless, drunken sleep fast became a nightmare. His mattress felt lumpy as the hay beneath his blankets had shifted during the night. The sun pierced through his open window, falling upon his face as it rose and causing him to wake. Gripping his bed frame in terror, he dared not to move, for fear that the thing that had come upon him in his sleep was real. A heavy, Green wool blanket still covered him to the neck, but was uncomforting. A terrified glance to his right told him that his room was now empty, save for the small table, chair, bedpan, and wash basin standing before the opposite wall. Wondering if he had left his chamber door closed and latched, he dared to look backward. Remembering now, it was something about the window, cut oversized to cool the room on hot days, that troubled him. Eyes, yes, yes, in those eyes, huge, round and luminous, 
A hulking black form surrounded them. Almost at once, his memory of it, or was it a dream, came flooding back. It chilled him to the bone. It was a feeling of terror that he had never before experienced. He was drunk when it came to the window, inebriated, and in such a condition that he could not even rise up from his bed to protect himself. Sliding awkwardly, like a huge, fat chicken, struggling to fit through a coop door too small, it entered through his window and into his room. The hulking mass blocked the moonlight and filled his world with a presence of sinister malice that he could never hope to describe. Its glowing eyes were calculating, intelligent, and condescending. He knew them now. They were the eyes of an owl, but hateful and unlike any owl that he had ever seen before. How such a being could have fit through his window he could not guess, but in an instant it was upon him, pinning him to his bed with four wicked curved talons that spanned his entire chest. Struggling to move, he felt their incredible sharpness pierce his nightshirt and then his skin. Bending down lower, it stared at him. A hiss rang out shrilly from its great beak. He tried to scream, but absolute terror stole his voice. Do not struggle, spy, it said. Beneath your nightshirt lies a scroll. Open it, and you will die. You will carry this message with all of the speed that you are able to your master. Delay, and your luck will falter more each day. This is your quest. Do you understand? Trying to nod, his body failed him. His pitiful strength was meaningless and comprised with drink. The inhuman strength that held him could steal his life at any moment. Good, good, the owl rasped. Then you are quested. Sleep now and remember your oath. Outside along the docks of Port Sina, he heard a great commotion. Finally daring to move, he felt his chest with his hands, searching himself for injuries. He found four tender spots, along with four small holes in his nightshirt and a small amount of blood. Looking further, he felt a small lump against his side. Grasping it, he drew it out. The object was a small, rolled-up parchment, sealed with blue wax and gold-colored yarn. Open it, and you will die, the owl's words echoed in his mind. Daring to rise, he swung his legs off the bed and sat up. His chest was sore, but no more than it would be after a bar fight. Scratching his beard, he became more aware of the chaos outside and the splitting pain of his hangover. Grabbing his pants from the bed rail, he put them on, and then his socks and his boots. Removing his shirt, he examined it. Four holes and seeping blood had stained it, but his outer shirt would cover it. The wounds were small puncture wounds that no longer bled. If they didn't fester, it would be a miracle. He rose then, stocky and six feet tall. He was no weakling. Staggering a bit to the chamber pot, he relieved himself and peered out the window. The harbor was a nightmarish crowd of people, livestock, mule-drawn carts and their wares. Soldiers were scattered about, trying to maintain order, but far, but for the most part, failing to do so. Three dragon ships had docked, and the fish market was a quarreling assemblage of unorganized townsfolk trying to get on board what was now what now numbered nine ships. <clears throat> what the hell? he said spontaneously to himself. We're leaving. The implications threw him for a moment, but he was not stupid. Their short-lived march to victory was clearly over. How they had captured three enemy warships he did not know, but he was not about to ask questions when his own ship was preparing to weigh anchor and strike her sails without him. Strapping on his belt, he checked his knives in his purse and exited his room at a run. Into the hallway and down the side stairs, he entered the main bar room. Behind the bar, the keeper was packing a few precious items into a large sack. Didn't you hear the news, Sonny, he asked. In another hour, there won't be any way off of this island without a long swim. I had one too many hauls off of that brandy of yours, old man. Help yourself to anything that you see, he offered. I know that I will never be coming back. 
Well, I don't mind if I do, sir, he replied, as he grabbed two gallons of his favorite and most expensive brandy. Mighty obliged. Don't wait for me, son. Get a move on. Luck to you, he said, before exiting the front door and clearing the stairs to the road below. Around him, entire families and their animals, animals were pouring into the port market. Some of them seemed to know where they were going, and others were totally lost. Excuse me, sir, one curly-haired woman greeted. Do you know where the fat goose is docked? She's that ship closest to the fish market, madam, he affirmed, pointing bottle in hand toward the north and into the deepest saddle of Port Cena. Oh, she observed, the one with the purple and white flag on it. That's the one, he said, while walking fast away. Good day to you. Chaos reigned in every ship that he passed. First Water Spirit, the Prince's own flagship, then the Fat Goose and the Silver Gull with the three dragon ships squeezed next to the docks between them. High-spirited was a ship upon which he held the rank of boatswain, which really meant ship's carpenter in charge of hull repairs and maintenance. But he was an officer, even if only a minor one. The son of an eastern merchant and a western basket weaver, he bore the darker skin and upturned eyes of his mother. His hair was long and contained in a single ample braid, that hung to his mid-back. His beard was full, thick, and well-groomed. People and animals packed the wharf area in front of his ship, and included Prince Ivan himself. Dancing his way around each obstacle, he managed to make the first gangplank. Dwayne Deckel, said the first mate. Ned bended to him. Nice of you to join us. Short in stature and light of build, Bender kept his light brown hair in check with a blue bandana. His brown eyes and laugh-lined face were attractive. I hope that she was worth it. He merely shrugged and returned a worried smile. Knowing how tough Bender was, he would be lucky if he did not get kitchen duty for the rest of the voyage. Ned was, Ned was also dangerously perceptive. Well, never mind that, Deckel, the lieutenant instructed. Stow those jugs and help me get these people on board. Just how bad is it, sir? The drow return with a vast force. Some have landed in Gala and others will soon be here. Our only chance is to set sail as soon as possible. The docks were now filling up faster than they could get people aboard, and some farmers had come to port. <clears throat> okay. And the footnote is drow, a slang term used by the Furman when referring to the dock alfar and derived from the term drow, D-R-O-W, of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, Fiend Folio, <clears throat> by Don Turnbull, etc. Okay. With entire flocks of sheep and dozens of cattle as well, things were fast getting out of hand. High-spirited was a beautiful merchantman of over a hundred and thirty feet in length and some forty feet across. With three masts, each with three sails and three lower decks, her hull was deep and shaped like the body of a fish with a long, even keel. Officers' chambers lay both fore and aft, and her carved figurehead was in the likeness of a laughing dolphin. Commissioned in safe haven like the rest of the prince's fleet, elfin artisans built and designed her, her well-trained crew worked hard to get as many refugees and soldiers aboard as possible. Deckel did his best to organize the frantic crowd before him. Form a line, people, he directed. Just you and your valuables, please. There won't be room for more. Good people, Prince Ivan greeted the crowd. Calm yourselves and maintain order. And that's where we'll leave off for today's episode 21. Episode 22 will take up again with Prince Ivan about one-third of the way down, page 172. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>